Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Chris Sullivan. I'll be your host and moderator for our Swiss Re Corporate Solutions Risk Management Webinar Series. With the official start to hurricane season in the Atlantic in just a week, we thought it would be appropriate to bring you the latest installment of the series, From Adria to Will to Storm, Names to Know This Hurricane Season. Leading the discussion will be Megan Lincoln, Senior Parametric NatCat Underwriter, Scott Carpenteri, Senior Structurer on our Innovative Risk Solutions Team, and Jackie Higgin, Head of Public Sector Solutions for North America. Before we get started, just a few quick logistical reminders. Attendees are in listen-only mode, so we encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation. We've left time, plenty of time at the end to go through those. And lastly, if you encounter any technical issues, press Control F5 to reset the platform. Okay, so now without further ado, I'll turn it over to Megan Lincoln. Thank you, Chris, and thank you for the introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, as we approach the beginning of the 2021 hurricane season. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but given that the 2020 hurricane season was one for the record books, let's just take a quick look back and refresh our memory as to what we saw last year. Um, the Atlantic had 30 named storms, which uh, was a record. There were 14 hurricanes that formed. And there were seven major hurricanes that formed, which meant that seven of those storms reached Category 3 intensity on the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale or higher. There were 11 landfalls that occurred in the United States. Uh, there was one Canadian landfall that was uh, Hurricane Teddy as it transitioned to a post-tropical cyclone. And there were two Central American landfalls late in the season with Hurricanes I Ada and Iota making landfall in Nicaragua at very strong intensity, both storms. Um, probably the most notable feature of the 2020 hurricane season was how many storms underwent what's known as rapid intensification. And this is when the storm's wind speeds increased by at least 35 knots in 24 hours. Ten storms underwent rapid intensification last year. And in addition to rapidly intensifying, many of those that underwent the process underwent it near the coast immediately before landfall, which presents some additional challenges as opposed to storms that are just undergoing rapid intensification out in the middle of the ocean. However, despite the records that were set during the hurricane season last year, economic and insured losses were moderate due to landfalls occurring in mostly sparsely populated locations or in developing countries. Um, cities like Miami, Tampa, Charleston were unscathed last year. So, but instead of looking back with June 1st nearly upon us and the first named storm of the Atlantic hurricane season already in the record books, it's time to look forward to what we can expect for 2021. Um, so first, a couple of questions to see how much you guys remember about last year and what you think we're going to be looking at this year. So the first poll question is, how many hurricane names were retired in 2020? And I think, I think you can enter it, and our uh, communications guru, Alex, will be collecting the, num the number, uh, numbers, the answers. Um, I will move on to the next one. How many hurricanes is the National Hurricane Center forecasting in 2021? The National Hurricane Center just released their forecast for this upcoming season last week on May 20th. All right, and our last question is open-ended. So in 2020, we exhausted the names that, we exhausted the standard list of names from the National Hurricane Center for the year, and we had to go into the Greek alphabet. That's why we had names like Alpha, Beta, Zeta, Delta, and so on and so forth, Iota. Um, but in, the uh, World Meteorological Organization made the decision after last year's hurricane season to move away from using the Greek alphabet in the Atlantic and 
replace it with a, an alternative list of names, which will be tapped into in the event that the standard list of names for the season is exhausted. So, and there are 24 names that are on the standard list. So will we need to use the alternative name list in 2021 as well? Or to put that another way, will we see more than 25, 24 name storms in the upcoming hurricane season? All right, so let's, we'll, we'll do the questions backwards. Um, so will we use the new list of names in 2021? The answers, more than half, think yes, which would mean another very hyperactive season in the Atlantic following 2020. How many, storm, how many storm names were retired in 2020? Despite the activity, the answer is three. Hurricane Laura, Ada, and Iota all have the distinguishment, if that's a word, of being retired. Um, and the middle question, how many hurricanes is the National Hurricane Center forecasting in 2021 happens to be on the next slide. Um, so Colorado State University, which is kind of pioneering in the hurricane forecasting arena, released their initial forecast for 2021 back in April. And they called for an active season, 17 named storms, eight hurricanes, four major hurricanes. Tropical Storm Risk, which is another forecasting institution, called for about the same as Colorado State when they, perform, when they issued their forecast in April 2021. Um, the only difference is they're calling for one less major hurricane, so three major hurricanes. And the National Hurricane Center, like I mentioned, just released their forecast for the upcoming season, and they are calling for 13 to 20 named storms, with six to 10 of those uh, being reaching hurricane intensity, and three to five of these six to 10 hurricanes reaching major hurricane intensity. So for those of you that said six to 10, congratulations. Uh, you were in the ballpark of the NHC forecast. So what can we expect for 2021? Why are we expecting these kinds of activity levels? Well, most of the variations that we see year to year in Atlantic hurricane activity is controlled by natural fluctuations in the Earth's climate system. Um, the main one is a feature that's known as the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. And when the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, or AMO, is in a positive phase, it causes warmer waters in the tropical Atlantic in between the coast of Africa and the Eastern Caribbean where these storms form. And this leads, and this hurricanes thrive and intensify in warmer waters. As long as the AMO is positive, we expect to see higher activity due to this warmer water in the tropical Atlantic. And the AMO has been in a positive phase since 1995. And there's no indications of that changing anytime soon. Um, the other natural variation in the climate system that Im influences Atlantic hurricane formation is the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is a periodic warming and cooling of the waters off the coast of Peru in the Pacific Ocean. Now, that doesn't impact the Atlantic Ocean temperatures, but rather what it does is it causes the uh, El Nino and its counterpart, La Nina, La Nina being the cooler waters, can cause changes in wind shear over the Atlantic Ocean. And wind shear is a change in wind speed and direction as you increase in height in the atmosphere. So as you go further up above the surface, if you have a lot of wind shear, so winds coming from different directions at different speeds, that's going to rip hurricanes apart. Conversely, if you have weaker wind shear, that will allow hurricanes to thrive because hurricanes are essentially towering columns of thunderstorms. And typically, La Nina leads to weaker wind shear over the Atlantic and more favorable conditions for Atlantic hurricanes. And last year, what we observed was we saw the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation in a warm phase, so the tropical Atlantic was warm. And we had, a, we had La Nina conditions in the Pacific, which decreased the wind shear. So that really allowed for a lot of hurricanes to form. This year, 
the current forecast is for kind of near neutral conditions in the Pacific. So no El Nino to really stunt the storm's growth, but at the same time, no La Nina to really add an additional favorable condition over the Atlantic. We're expecting it to have a relatively muted influence this year. Now, obviously, we also have to consider what the impacts of climate change are, and we can't definitively say that climate change is the root cause of a single hurricane or a single active hurricane season. But a lot of what we're seeing and what we have seen over the last decade or so is consistent with what we would expect to see in a world that is warming, where the oceans are warming at the rate that they are warming at. Um, so we expect to see slower moving storms. And we've seen that. Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Florence, Hurricane Dorian. Uh, I don't really think we had any that stalled in 2020. Uh, Hurricane Sally, as it approached the coast, moved a little slow rapidly intensifying storms. Like I mentioned, we saw 10 of them in 2020, and as long as conditions are favorable and there's enough warm water for these hurricanes to tap into, they will rapidly intensify. And the last one is wetter storms. We have seen storms dropping a lot of precipitation in a single area, a lot of rain. So again, Harvey, Florence, um, these storms are very wet. They're causing not only storm surge and winds all along the coast, but significant flooding can occur quite a way inland. Um, and I, I think obviously probably the question on everybody's mind is, okay, so this is the forecast. What does this mean for impacts? What does this mean for the Caribbean? What does this mean for the U.S.? What does this mean for Mexico, Central America, and Canada? And the answer is we, re we really don't yet know. Um, there are no reliable ways to make landfall forecasts at this point in time because hurricanes are going to be steered by the weather conditions in which they develop when they develop. And they're not out there right now. So we don't know what sort of weather conditions they're going to be embedded in which will determine where they will go and if they will ultimately make landfall and be a threat to the coast or if they will simply curve out to sea and harm only a couple and disrupt only a couple of fish. So the real message is stay tuned. We're expecting another busy season. Keep your eye on the National Hurricane Center. Keep your eye on the news. And it's always good per to be prepared because only one storm can make a season memorable. And now I will turn it over to Jackie, who will talk a little bit about how we address and design products to address hurricane risks. Thank you, Megan. So we thought that <clears throat> what it would be helpful for those of you who are not familiar with our STORM product, that we could provide a brief overview. And while we know the Paramec solutions are not new, recently we have seen an increase in interest from our clients with respect to STORM and coverage for other perils such as floods and hail as a way to complement their traditional indemnity programs. And given the parametrics offering distinct advantages, such as, as you can see here, um, that the trigger uses an independent data provider and that the settlement is based upon um, this, this data provider um, and triggering at specific locations. It offers a quick payout in as little as 30 days, and the coverage is an insurance form with respect to that the post event is determined in confirmation of actual financial loss. And it addresses um, impact at a local level with damage caused by, by the wind speed at each of the insured locations, and there's no dollar deductible. And for, for my clients, for the, private, for the public sector clients, really what's of real interest as well as the commercial clients is the broad coverage and the flexibility and the use of funds. So one thing that is always on all of our minds is why do commercial and public entities seek out these solutions and what problem or problems are they trying to solve? So for hurricanes, are they seeking protection to help with deductible retention or supplemental coverage for traditionally excluded sublimited exposures such as landscaping? or additional protection to supplement net business interruption or additional expenses, or, or all of the above. M 
Megan and Scott, who have deep expertise and experience designing many of these solutions with both public and commercial entities, will share some more examples on the commercial side. But for the public sector, I thought it would be helpful to also talk about you know, what existing financial recovery tools are available and why do they have their limitations. So for the public sector, disaster aid can be slow, it requires a local match, it can be inflexible in its uses, limited in its reimbursement, and the unknown amount makes it hard to plan for budget certainty. And in addition, the other tools like raising taxes and issuing debt come with their own challenges and limitations. So given these limitations, the public entities look for these innovation, innovative risk transfer solutions and insurance in general to help them close the protection gap faster in a more efficient and more flexible way. And specifically, we find that public entities are seeking supplemental coverage for traditionally excluded expenses such as evacuation costs, temporary housing, overtime pay, and debris removal. And as we mentioned this before, this broad coverage and flexibility is of real, real interest. So we thought today, given that there have been a variety of webinars that we've conducted on these products before, that it might be helpful to provide some color as to what, what are some of the use cases and some of the client examples that we've seen in wanting to use STORM in particular, but parametrics in general. And I thought that I would just provide a few examples um, from working with, with, with my clients. So in 2010, after the devastating earthquake ravaged the small island of Haiti, which caused over $250,000 250, lives lost and billions of economic damages, the payment, which was triggered by shaking intensity, did not make them whole. But it was the largest, fastest cash infusion received. And due to its flexibility, the government was able to keep paying police salaries, keeping the streets safe, which clearly was critical after, after the aftermath. Another example, as recently as this past October, the government of Quintana Roo in Mexico saw the benefits of their parametric coral reef insurance after it was triggered by a tropical storm. This payout was used to fund vital reef repair activities, which is critical to Quintana Roo's tourism revenue. And it helped to, to um, restore the beach itself, property, and, and the livelihoods of the individuals who rely on tourism sector for their livelihoods. Currently, we're working with a few clients who are struggling to help low-income citizens access cooling and heating when faced with extreme temperatures to structure a parametric solution that can quickly trigger when temps hit above or below certain thresholds to help speed up some response times, helping those in needs and protect budgets. And finally, some of our clients are interested in our parametric flood offerings to provide them with immediate access to funding for evacuations, temporary housing, access to bottled water, critical pairs, and debris removal. So fundamentally, we believe these solutions helped close the protection gap and improve resilience and recovery. Um, but I'm sure my colleagues Megan and Scott will have many more examples to share. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, can, uh, can you hear me okay, Chris and Jackie? Just a quick check-in. Sound great. Yep. Okay, thanks, thanks. Um, so yeah, actually, uh, appreciate the, the setup there, Jackie, and also, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining in. So for those who, who know our webinar series well, uh, we've, we've covered this topic uh, a few times from different angles in the past. We've shown you the mechanics of parametric insurance, including our earthquake product and our hurricane product particularly. Uh, we've showed you what to expect when looking to, uh, to solve the, 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 the problem and use parametric as a tool. Uh, but this time around, what we thought we'd do, and to echo what Jackie was, was saying, is talk about why this parametric is, is such a useful tool. Um, we actually prefer to call it a tool around here than a product because it's, it really is more customizable. Uh, it's not just an off-the-shelf, one-size-fits-all for everyone. As you could hear from the examples that Jackie just provided from some of her clients, um, very, very different use cases and needs for different uh, clients. Um, so the, that's the, the beauty of this, this tool is so, you know, sounds neat. You can have, buy, have an insurance policy that pays if the wind blows at a particular wind speed in a particular location. Sounds cool, but 
why is that so useful? Why is that so revolutionary? Why is that changing the world? And, and the reason is because it allows for risk transfer solutions that were otherwise difficult or impossible to achieve using the classic uh, indemnity insurance forms that we're, we were all accustomed to in the insurance space. So what we wanted to do is just continue on with the examples and give everyone an idea of these are actual conversations that we've had, actual work that we've done with clients of various sectors, different, uh, different size clients, different, uh, different industries, uh, whether it's corporate or public entities. Uh, it, it's, it's quite broad. And, and, and we say, you know, when we're asked, who, who would be a good client for a parametric solution? Uh, it, it's really true that anybody facing one of the, the perils that we can actually tr cover, cover on a parametric basis could actually use the tool for some of their risk protection. The reality is while classic indemnity insurance is, is, is very powerful, does a, a, a wonderful job, there are still gaps. There are still places where uh, it's just it's very difficult, if not impossible, to cover all the costs that come uh, a, a client's way in the face, in the wake of a natural disaster. And so this tool allows a broadening of the coverage uh, by, by hitting this different angle, that by paying based on the event itself, uh, rather than necessarily uh, the, the specific items listed in the, in, in the indemnity policy. So um, with that, we'll continue on here and show a few examples and really talk to a few examples of what we've worked on uh, with some of our clients. Um, largely in this section, we'll talk about corporates, but there's actually even some public entity examples in here as well. So if you think about, so what's this tool used for? Well, first of all, it's very broad. So you, the, the, the insured can use the funds for whatever costs come their way following the event. Um, and we just don't know ahead of time how events will unfold from both a physical standpoint, as the, the points that Megan was making earlier, but also an economic standpoint, right? Will this event be more of a physical damage element for a particular insured? Will it be more of an operations uh, pro problem for the insured or some combination thereof? That's the beauty of the parametric insurance policy is you can use the funds for whatever the need is. We What we all can agree on is that if significant wind speeds uh, uh, impact uh, the, the insured's area of, of operations or where their assets are, um, something's going to cost them some money and there's a very chance, good chance that there will be costs that are outside of the scope of either their, their insurance policy or even what FEMA or what, what um, any of the, the aid uh, might be coming to them. So the big three categories are very, very classic insurance here. The, you know, extra expense, really, really powerful use cases for using uh, the parametric tools for, for those. Uh, business interruption, which includes, so in corporate world, that's sort of revenue and income, but also in Jackie's world too, in the public sector space, there's a lot of you know, tax revenue, tourist uh, tax revenue, uh, hotel tax revenues, those sorts of things. Very, very important and vital to, to public entities, just like those revenue streams are, are, are vital and important to, to corporates. And then, of course, the physical damage is, is certainly the parametric funds can be used for classic physical damage. Um, from the extra expense side, um, one of the ones that we're seeing a lot these days is staffing costs or employee assistance. So if you think about uh, an, a, a hurricane coming through and maybe you have a hotel on a, a beachfront hotel, the hotel did okay. Uh, maybe a little bit of damage, but not too bad, or, or maybe no damage at all. But the general area was, was hit pretty hard, and the infrastructure was a mess. And so now you're able to keep your doors open as a hotel, but you have staffing issues because half your staff actually can't make it to work because of either problems of their own at their own homes or infrastructure problems or a comp combination thereof. Then you're relying on the, this, the other half of your staff to make up for the, for the lack of staff, and you're paying overtime costs and all sorts of things. These are all tremendous expenses, a lot of, lot of decisions to be made. Um, parametric policy can, can help with that, uh, and, we're, and we're seeing that a lot. Uh, in the tech space, and uh, we've, we've actually worked with clients as well, um, using taking this sort of staffing angle, uh, if you think about any, any high-skilled uh, labor force, whether it's pharmaceutical, you know, 
programmers in the in the in the technology space. Um, this is really their supply chain. And and when you look at supply chain schematics, and we we had a webinar last week talking about supply chain, and and particularly after COVID, people are spend, spending a lot more time focusing on supply chain. One of the ones that's sometimes overlooked is the actual employee base is technically part of your supply chain. And you know how can you help protect that? How can you ensure that that you have a responsive uh, product to, to help with the costs associated with a disruption to that portion of your supply chain. Parametric triggers can be used uh, in that respect. We've actually worked with, with clients where we put triggers not necessarily where their operations were. Um, we put triggers where they had key either employees or actually key concentrations of customers is another way uh, to use these triggers. So uh, what happens to your customers, particularly if you have a discretionary, uh, you know, entertainment type, uh, type of, of, of uh, offering, uh, your, if your clients are, are hit with hardship, you may actually feel it yourself because you're, uh, you're not going to have the revenues that, that you had because the discretionary spending might be down for a period of time. Um, increased cost of insurance is an interesting one. So when you think about it, what are the costs to, uh, to an organization after a hurricane? Well, uh, one of the costs is uh, that in the following renewal cycle, there's a very good chance, of, particularly if the rates were maybe depressed, uh, that the rates will, will go up. Well, that's actually a real cost to the insured that, that would not have happened but for this event. Uh, that's actually, we've actually had clients that that was one of their primary considerations is they, they knew they had a really good rate. Uh, their, their particular area hadn't been hit for a very long time. They recognized that they were probably benefiting from that. And the next time the area got hit, the rates were probably going to change. And so that was actually one of the, one of the use cases, one of the more interesting and clever use cases that we've, we've worked with uh, some, some folks. Um, on to the real estate space. So if you think about uh, real estate organizations, we work with a lot of real estate companies. And one of the things that they have to decide, uh, again, may, maybe the, the assets are, are did okay, um, but again, the, the infrastructure in the area is damaged pretty bad. The, the general business activity in the area is impacted pretty badly. And so as a real estate owner, you may be fine, your bu buildings may be in fairly good shape, but your customers, your tenants, um, they may be in having much more difficult time than you are. It may be in the real estate company's best interest to maybe provide a rent holiday and say, you know, we're going to give you three, six months to just get back on your feet. Um, and in the best, it's the best long-term interest of everyone to do that rather than to, you know, seek, uh, you know, evictions and that sort of thing. And so uh, these, are, these are tools that can be very, very useful and, and quite useful to the long-term stability of both the real estate organization, organization and their, their, their customers, their tenants. Um, this one comes up fairly often too, um, post-event building code or zoning law changes. Uh, there are, there is some recovery for things like that in some classic indemnity insurance policies. Uh, this is a way to sort of backstop that. So we're not saying that these, these types of, of, of costs are not necessarily covered elsewhere, but they may not be covered uh, to the extent uh, necessary. Uh, and, and there are always nuances and circumstances that can pull through the gaps of the, of the cracks of the traditional insurance policy. Um, another extra expense, a huge one, it can be electricity or, 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 or generator costs. So following an event, uh, again, maybe your assets were damaged, maybe not, um, but, the, but the, infrastructure, the, the power infrastructure is a bit fragile. And power, you know, we saw in Puerto Rico, power was out in some parts of the island for months and months and months. Well, that is pretty expensive oper uh, circumstance to try to keep a business running when you're running off of generators and, and trying to find all, supplemental power. So those are real costs, again, that come in the wake of a, of a natural disaster. Um, another, another one on extra expense too is uh, civil disruption, right? So a lot of folks, uh, one of the things they're planning for is they might need to bring extra security in, uh, particularly if it be some critical operations, say hospitals and that sort of thing. Uh, hospitals really need to stay open following uh, an event there as best they can because the community needs them even more following uh, a natural disaster. And so uh, everything just tends to get more expensive when you have sort of a post-disaster scenario. Resources are scarce, uh, things aren't moving as well as they were, infrastructure is, is often damaged. And so 
these this tool can be very helpful to help provide a little extra extra shot of liquidity, a little extra a little extra revenue and, and, and funds to help deal with the problems while the insured is facing the problems. Um, I personally was sitting with a with a hospital uh, client once and we were talking about parametric insurance and it was really really interesting to talk about parametric insurance with folks. It's it's very different from classic in, indemnity insurance and sometimes it takes the more the more seasoned someone is in insurance, the trickier it is for them to get their head around this the idea that this pays based on the event rather than waiting to to do the the old the old school claims adjudication. And the junior um, uh, risk manager really was understanding what was going on, and I was watching her eyes get wider and wider and wider as we were as we were talking. And she leaned over to her boss and said, "You know, we just did a business continuity exercise for one of our more tertiary cities, and you know that we estimated it would cost us about three million dollars if that was an actual live event rather than the exercise. And so, just a, a really interesting example of how these funds can be used." Uh, sort of for those emergency situations and, and those, those costs. Um, the section, second category, business interruption. Uh, so basically, we've, the extra expense and business interruption sort of sometimes go hand in hand. So there's a little examples in, in my, my first section. Um, so just general loss of revenue. Uh, again, uh, this is where uh, classic indemnity insurance does provide for business interruption loss of revenue. One of the tricky parts that, that are, are our um, colleagues in the indemnity side of the house, they have to have a damage trigger in order for them to be able to underwrite and price this. Um, so, you know, there are many times there's a loss of revenue, um, but without a damage trigger. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky for, for the, the pr classic product to, to respond appropriately. So the parametric, again, doesn't care. There's no damage trigger. It's just the wind speed itself, just the event itself. So very, very helpful to, to use for that, what we call the non-damage business interruption. Um, there, there can be gaps in traditional um, time in insurance, waiting periods, et cetera. Um, again, this, 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 when we're measuring the event itself, it, there, it can help fill in some of these gaps of where the classic policies maybe have time deductibles or, or classic deductibles. Um, loss of attraction is a really interesting one. So there is both the Beachfront hotel, hurricane comes through, the beach is a mess, the, the, the bridge is out, um, you know, business may be down for, for a while. Uh, that's very, very classic, and whether or not there was physical damage will determine if classic in indemnity insurance will respond, or um, you know, if you had a parametric policy, this can help fill in some of the gaps. Um, there's another concept that we're noticing, which, we're gonna, which I'm calling perceived lack of or loss of attraction. Um, we've noticed this to be the case um, with, say, the, the Napa wildfires. We've, we talked to folks that had either wineries with wine tasting rooms or inns, and because there was so much news coverage of the Napa fires, there was a perception that everything in Napa was gone. So there were, there were business owners in the Napa area that had a major decline in their revenues but they weren't impacted at all. However, it didn't matter because of the news cycle and the perception was that they probably were damaged. And, and we can envision this being a case in other tourist areas where you know, major headlines that there was a hurricane that came through, you, your particular operation might be fine, your building might have been built to newer standards and, and um, doing very well. But with that perception, you still may have a drop in revenue. Again, these, these products respond to what happens in the local area. So very, very possible that you can have a parametric here that could help for things like that. Um, and then to sort of tax, uh, to Jackie's world, um, loss of tax revenue. And we've, we've spoken, we've worked with many, many public entities where um, you know, taxes are vital, you know, particularly, I mean, everywhere, but particularly in, in tourist type areas. Um, you know, if that airport gets knocked out, um, you know, that's going to have a major knock-on effect to the local community. Um, there are ways to structure products that, that help deal with some of those direct costs and, and really help the community rebound. And then thirdly, physical damage. So, yeah, 
It doesn't have to be the, the unusual stuff. You, you can use the parametric proceeds for just regular old physical damage, whether that's uh, helping to infill a deductible um, or um, other difficult to insure assets such as landscaping. Landscaping is a tricky one. Generally things that are alive, trees, plants. Uh, we work with, with greenhouse companies. Uh, very difficult to get the, the, the insurance on the actual sort of livestock, so to speak. Um, golf courses are very tricky. Tees and greens, there's usually pretty significant supplement on those, and so this can help supplement uh, coverage for golf courses. Transmission and distribution lines, we've worked with many utilities. Um, E&D lines generally, very, very fragile assets, very difficult to underwrite and to get uh, proper coverage for. Well, if you're paying based on just a hurricane hitting the area, it's a way to, it's a way to actually secure coverage for these types of assets. And another interesting one is historic properties. We've worked with histor uh, folks who've owned historic properties. So in a classic indemnity policy, very difficult to adjudicate a claim on a historic property. You know, do they pay to bring it back to the standards of the building as it was built, or is it just will kind of pay as an industry to replace things with plastic? Well, a lot of the historic building owners don't like that, that second option. Well, the parametric actually allows them to have funds that they use uh, at their discretion. So if they deem that the correct thing to do is to use classic standards that are more expensive to repair the building, well, that is a cost that they're having as, event to, as a result of the event, and the parametric funds could be used for that. So really interesting use cases. It, it's, we've, we've really enjoyed having these types of discussions with folks, and so many times we get a, a broker or a client come back to us and say, I just thought of another case. Could it be used like this? And really, really awesome when, um, when the concept resonates and we get these, these, these inquiries back. Um, we have one client also that actually purchases a parametric insurance, and they like this, the speed of payout because, in their view, following a natural disaster, the the the, the repair work, the the contractors will be in short supply, and basically, uh, the first one that has money gets the contracts first for the contractors, and so they wanted to make sure they had that quick liquidity to secure those contractors and really get their their vital. Uh, operations back up and running as fast as possible. So some very uh, eclectic type examples across different types of, of clients and, 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 and regions and, and such in, in this, but we really wanted to share that with, with everyone on the call here because we think that we've showed the mechanics of, of parametric and storm many times, but maybe giving someone the idea of the breadth of the things we've actually talked about will get the wheels turning for the audience here today. And, and we're very happy to have discussions, whether it's through your, the Q&A session, section here coming up, or if it's one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations, if you have some ideas. Um, I'll, I'll pause for a second, and I know Megan has also had some great experiences, and maybe there's, there's a few that I, I missed here that she'd like to throw in. You know what, Scott, thanks for turning it back over to me, but in the interest of time and to make sure we have ample amount of time for a question and answer session. I think you pretty much covered 99% of uh, my examples as well. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Megan. That was fantastic. We have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, and please feel free, if, you, if, you're, uh, if something's on your mind, ask away. We're going to try to work through as many as we can here. Um, there was a question from the audience about who is our underwriting contact for parametric solutions. So um, Megan and Scott on the line uh, could be, certainly, um, your access point for those discussions. If you know any Swiss Re property underwriters, um, you could reach out to them. We, we have a very flat team, uh, and we all work very closely together. And if it's a pub public entity, public sector client, Jackie Higgins and her team can help. Uh, but again, we, we all work very closely together and collaborate on parametric deals. But thank you for asking that. Um, so let me start with a question. Maybe I'll start, Megan, how about we'll start with you. Um, going back to kind of your opening remarks, you had referenced slow moving versus rapidly intensifying storms. Um, and, you know, it's somewhat a contradiction in terms. Could you kind of expand on that, slow moving versus rapidly intensifying? 
Sure. Thanks for the question, Chris. Um, so when I say rapidly intensifying, um, so hurricanes do two things. They're, they're two-dimensional storm systems. You know, you can, if you watch the news and you're watching the weather, you see them on satellite. Uh, really strong storms will have a very clear eye. They will be spinning like a pinwheel. Um, so when I say rapidly intensifying, I mean a storm very quickly going from a somewhat indistinguishable blob of thunderstorms to a storm that kind of has that classic look, the pinwheel look with a very, very clear and distinct eye, and you can see it rotating. So those would be your rapidly intense, and, and storms that do that in very short order will be storms that have rapidly intensified. Um, slow me, the hurricanes also move. They will be pushed around the globe by various weather systems, including they'll be picked up by jet streams and, and steered in that fashion. Um, so when I say slow-moving storms, I mean the hurricane itself will actually stall or move very slowly. Um, and that's because it just gets into an area where there's nothing else to move it. Uh, and that's exactly what we saw with Hurricane Harvey. Hurricane Harvey went through the Caribbean. It actually dissipated. It then moved into the Gulf of Mexico and... Um, it intensified and there were weather systems that were pushing it towards the Texas coast. It moved on shore along the Texas coast. And then essentially what happened was there was nothing else to pick it up and move it away. There was no jet stream coming in to push it away. And it just kind of sat over the Houston area for a couple days and dumped a ton of rain. So when I say slow-moving storms, that's what I mean. The hurricane itself doesn't really go very far in a short length of time, um, whereas rapidly intensifying hurricanes are those storms that kind of go from amorphous blobs to very um, aesthetically appealing pinwheel-looking storms. Thank you, Megan. Um, Jackie, here's a question. Um, referring back to some of your comments earlier, you referenced insuring the coral reef off the coast of Mexico. How are you able to insure a natural asset? So that's a great question. And I think one of the things that we're really trying to get across and get um, public entities understand that we want to protect our natural assets in the same way that we want to protect our public assets, like property. So we can structure the, um, the parametric in, in, in the same way, but using the asset um, as the fundamental, using the natural asset, whether it be a coral reef or a mangrove or a salt marsh, um, in the same way that we would use property. And it's really one to protect the natural asset. So in order to ensure that um, you can have uh, money available um, to restore the asset itself and the cost of cleanup and removal of debris, or as Scott had um, discussed, protecting the revenue derived from that asset um, with respect to business interruption or, again, um, funds to clean up restoration. And we would also extend it even further um, in our nature-based insurance solutions kind of suite um, products that enable um, the ability to de-risk ecological engineering or nature-based construction. So the application is quite broad, but it's really um, to help these natural assets become more financially resilient over time. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, Scott, here's a question for you. Um, how does parametric insurance interact with traditional insurance if there is any overlapped coverage? I guess, and is there any overlapping coverage? Great question, Chris. Uh, yeah. So uh, basically, one could be excess of the other, could go either direction. Generally speaking, the parametric is, quote, unquote, excess of the traditional uh, insurance, um, although it, by excess, it means sort of uh, whatever the traditional doesn't cover. So when, if you think about a traditional insurance policy, there are deductibles, there are exclusions, there are sublimits. Uh, there are often compromises when it comes to business interruption, uh, 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 you know, settlements. Uh, the parametric almost acts as a nice sort of catch-all for all of those cases that either 
don't fit into the traditional uh, indemnity policy well, or perhaps the client feels that their recovery should have been higher on the traditional indemnity policy. Um, this is where it really works nicely. It, it can kind of morph into any and all of those, uh, depending on you know, the nature of the event. Great. Um, Megan, how about one for you? Um, and I'm going to put together a bunch of similar questions that have come in. One would be around the um, availability of parametric solutions um, by geography. So most of our audience I could see is North America. So we have US, Canada, we have guests from Mexico on the line, um, and some from Central America. Can you comment about the, the availability by geography of parametric solutions? Sure, so uh, thanks for the question, Chris. Um, so geographic availability on the hurricane side, uh, we can offer a storm parametric cover, um, which is our local wind speed based intensity parametric cover for any location that is covered by the National Hurricane Center. So that would be the Caribbean, that would be Mexico, that would be uh, the United States, and that would also be the west coast of Mexico and Hawaii. Um, earthquake, we can do pretty much anywhere. Uh, we rely on USGS as the data provider. Um, and in the event that clients in Canada or Central America are interested in hurricane, uh, we can talk on an individual basis and figure out what's the best option. Is a storm solution feasible or is a cat in the geometry where you would look at the storm track going through a predefined geometry to determine a trigger a better option? Great. Thank you, Megan. Scott, I'm going to give you two questions here, just preparing some that have come in together. Uh, one is, uh, what is our capacity, maximum capacity deployment available from Swiss Re? And the other is, and you kind of referenced this earlier, but is the product available in both insurance and derivative form? So those two, please. Yep, great, great questions. Um, so. Uh, the, the capacity, uh, we will work on solutions as small as one to five million dollars of limit, and we will work on solutions as high as 50 to 100 million dollars of limit or even higher. Um, one of the nice benefits of working with Swiss Re is you're accessing a company with ver various capabilities, so uh, we can scale up beyond our corporate solutions appetite with the help of our, our reinsurance colleagues. and. And quite frankly, I've personally worked on parametric opportunities where we were talking about a billion dollars uh, of limit. Uh, all depends on sort of client budget and um, appetite on, on either side. Uh, one of the things we do watch carefully is our accumulation. So you might say, hey, we worked for Swiss Re once, and they, they said we could only maybe do you know, a, 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 a limit smaller than some of the numbers I'm saying in a particular area. Uh, that is depending on our accumulations. Um, but so uh, there, are, there are places where we do get a, a, a little bit uh, stacked, and we watch that very carefully because we, we, and we intend to be here to pay those claims um, and, and even sell the next policy after with, you know, with, with, with everyone uh, being still happy with the product. So uh, that, is, that is definitely something we watch carefully. But what limits can get, very high. Uh, it's a little bit different process, so we'll we'll manage the time expectations on that. Um, but but we can go quite quite large uh, if if there is really a, a strong need, and, and of course the, the client has the budget. Um, for your second question, question Chris, the uh, derivative versus insurance. Uh, in short, we can do either. So uh, for for those on the call who are not familiar, so basically if you have an insurance or a policy or a, an, a, an agreement that says if the wind speed is this high, you get this much money. Um, you can write that on a derivative basis, which has no questions asked. It's just here it is, and, and it goes. The, there are pros and cons to having a derivative, including the thing that's probably freaking out half the people that it's a derivative. Um, and then the other way we do it, in 90, 95 to 99% of the cases, we actually can write it on an insurance policy form, which has all the same mechanics. Um, but there is one additional step where the client does need to confirm that they did have loss and need at least as great as the the, the payouts they received from us. Um, however, if you uh, when you think about this being a supplemental product, most of our clients buy limits very that are quite modest compared to the full exposure that they have, and so we think the vast majority of our clients will have very little trouble justifying. 
uh, that they needed the, the parametric. And unfortunately, there's just so many costs that come uh, a, a client's way following a natural disaster that it's, it's really quite easy to justify in, in most cases uh, two or five or ten million dollars uh, worth of worth of cost. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Jackie, there's a public entity related question that I really like because I think there's applicability for corporates as well. So I'll turn it first to you and then uh, Scott and Megan, if you have any comments, please feel free to chime in. So here's the question. Public entities usually have a lot of locations assets dispersed over a large geographic area. How do you approach this when developing a parametric solution? So Chris, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that we first try to understand what the public entity's main concern is. So what are they really worried about and what do they want the parametric for? So if it's to fulfill, um, let's say they're deductible, then we can structure the parametric so it aligns with their traditional coverage, their asset values. But if it's unknown costs after an extreme weather event, then we may look at a wider geographic area um, so the product triggers when it's needed. Um, and I don't know if Scott and Megan want to add anything to that given their deep experience. So one, one comment I'll so, make uh, is that you don't have to use it everywhere you have an asset. So we can uh, structure something that is more broad, and, and I think Megan, I'll, I'll turn it to Megan on that, because Megan has a great, lots of great examples on that, uh, but you don't necessarily have to use it for everywhere you have assets. You can use this tool very strategically. So some clients will say, oh my goodness, I, I do have assets across the state, but there are two or three key locations where that is so critical. If I lose though, I find I'm going to have a lot of problems, or maybe those assets are driving their PMLs uh, in their in their quantification of their traditional risk and taking a little bit of a burden off of that might help their traditional property program flow a little bit better. Thanks, Scott. So, yeah, to expand upon Scott's point is, number one, we can definitely only look at key assets. Um, if the government has assets, if, if it's a state and they have assets everywhere, but they've identified a few that are key, we can tie the parametric trigger locations to those particular assets. Um, you know, the other thing that we can do is, is because these products are so flexible, um, they're not necessarily tied or they don't necessarily require an underlying asset portfolio. When um, determining where to assign value, we can use different underlying information like population. Um, maybe population is the best way to distribute value throughout an area. Um, another thing we can do is if the geographic footprint is particularly large, is if a, if a client, for example, is interested in purchasing a $10 million parametric, we will maybe distribute um, 40 to 50 million throughout the covered area to allow for multiple events that don't necessarily impact the entire geographic area, but a partial piece of the area to provide the client with a full payout. So there's multiple ways that we can address both the size of the geography and the planned intention of the cover. Thank you all. Um, we had a couple questions come in around the claims process. Uh, so what does that look like? Scott, would you comment, start commenting on that? Sure. Yeah, in short, the, the, the way it works is it's almost as though a parametric is, is like a pre-adjudicated claim. I've had, I've had folks, when they kind of got their head around this, they've said that, and I thought that was a good way to put it. So we agree ahead of time that at the, the various wind speeds, the, the client's entitled to various payouts. Um, it's not binary either. Generally speaking, uh, there's, you, know, you might get a certain amount of money for 80 miles an hour sustained winds and more money if it's 90 and more money if it's 100 and et cetera. So, um, it, it's meant to, it's the, the path's pretty flexible and kind of correlates to what the client might be feeling financially uh, for pain, uh, pain on the ground. Um, but so we, we agree ahead of time, and then when the event happens, uh, we will pull the data from the data provider. The, the client does file a claim with us and say, hey, we 
something happened and we, we think we, we might have been triggered, uh, we'll pull the data and determine if they're triggered. Uh, if they are, uh, we will ask them to do an initial assessment of loss, which basically says, uh, do you think you need the money? In most cases, the client will say, oh yeah, we've got some problems. We don't know what it is right now, but we know we've got some things to deal with. We will pay them the, the, the funds generally within about 30 days. Um, and then uh, we give the client a year so they get the money right away, so now they can face the problems while they're, you know, they can deal with the problems while they're facing the problems and have uh, some liquidity to, 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 to assess those, those types of expenses. And then what we do is we give them a year to determine, okay, after the dust is settled, after they had a chance to catch their breath, okay, what, what costs did they really have? What were indemnified elsewhere? What was still net to them? Uh, when the client feels comfortable that, Yep, they've done in a calculation and accounting that they can clearly attest and justify that they did not have a windfall. That's really all we care about from the insurance standpoint is did you, you, you can't have a windfall. Um, some clients very quickly, within two or three months, they realize, oh my goodness, we we had way more out-of-pocket expense than even our parametric uh, payout. So they, they sign a form and, and, and send it off to us. We close the claim. Some clients need a little bit more time, which is totally fine as well, to figure out sort of what was what was a cost to them and, and what was uh, not recoverable elsewhere. Scott, a related question has come in uh, a couple of times. So can I press you on the speed of payment? So you, a couple of times we've referenced maximum of 30-day payout. Can we pay sooner? Uh, there are times we pay sooner, yep. So, I, uh, so that question is, is valid. It really is a matter of the data provider and the type of data. So if you're talking about the track of a hurricane, which we basically have nearly live, um, those cases, uh, there is a bit of a process. The client does need to file a claim or notify us. We do have to pull the data and do the report. Um, but we have paid as, in, in as soon as 14 days when it's data that's readily available and everybody's doing their steps uh, straight on time. Um, with some of the other data providers that we use, some of the other solutions, uh, it takes a little more time for the, the, the scientist, if you will, to actually process the data. And so that's where the more 30-day type time frames come into play. Um, it really just depends on the trigger and the type of, of, of data we're using. Thanks. Okay, we're, there's a few more I want to get to, so we're going to speed through the last few, if that's okay, with my two, three colleagues here. Um, Megan, what about, what do you need from an underwriting perspective to write a solution? Um, the main piece of information that we need is location. Um, and, you know, as Scott touched on in his, when he was giving use case discussions, that location doesn't necessarily have to be a client-owned asset. It could be something like an airport. It could be something like another critical piece of infrastructure like a bridge. But what we need to know is where is the asset or assets that you are concerned about, whether or not you own them or you just have a financial interest in them. So that's really the key piece of information. Other um, additional information that is helpful but not necessarily absolutely critical would be, you know, are there how, what historical events have occurred that you might be particularly concerned about. Um, we don't tend to oversolve these solutions for one or two events because the past isn't always necessarily prologue. But if there is an event or two that were of a concern for you, we would like to know what its impact was and what it would look like under any of our proposed structures. Um, other additional pieces of information that are relevant are a budget, uh, budgets, how much limit you're potentially looking for, but again, that's not, not absolutely critical. It's just information that's nice to have and can provide us with a little more insight up front when determining or designing a solution. But the real key piece of information is location, location, location. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Scott, since you're a non-physical damage, business interruption-minded person, a question came in around, do you see parametric branching out to non-CAT lines or other ERM type exposures to loss? Definitely, yeah. So the, our view is if you can measure it and, and you can model it, um, we should be able to do parametric solutions. So um, we definitely weather solutions we've been doing for, for many, many years. Um, we've used damageability triggers. So uh, maybe an asset that a client doesn't own but has a 
key, their business is hooked to that asset if that thing is destroyed. So a third-party asset, um, you know, can we indemnify a, a, a client based on the damage to a third-party asset? We've actually been able to do certain solutions like that before. As long as it's something we can get our arms around and feel like we can underwrite, um, and then, you know, is the trigger uh, objective? So they're, they're very, very clear that this thing happened in the universe because um, we don't, really want to sit and argue about it for three years. This is not uh, what Parametric's about. Thank you, Scott. Um, okay, so everybody hang out for one second, just a couple of closing remarks. First of all, thank you, Jackie Higgins, Megan Lincoln, and Scott Carpenteri for walking us through a super interesting discussion. Um, there are a couple questions we didn't get to that we're going to try to we'll reach out to you directly on. We have a poll that I've just put up on the screen. Let us know how we're doing. Uh, we want to make sure that we curate the right content for you and we're delivering uh, value and, and good use of your time. Um, in the coming days, we'll have a copy of this uh, recording that we're going to share with, with the audience. Uh, feel free to rewatch and share uh, as you'd like. And you can always reach out to any one of us with questions. We'd love to continue the conversation. And lastly, we have on June 23rd, we're going to talk about the economics of climate change with our North American CEO, Yvonne Gonzalez, and Jerome Hegley, our chief economist. should be super interesting. Stay tuned for invitations, and follow us on LinkedIn for updates and other thought leadership pieces. And with that, I thank you all again. You've been a great audience. Thanks for joining us, and we wish you a great rest of the week.